Well, that night when Jesus took the bread and broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we have to remember because else we forget. <laughs> Isn't that terrible that we can forget the God of the universe? And yet that is so true. We do. We see Israel over and over again. They're forgetting. And, and Jesus institutes this communion to remember what he went through, right? The brutal beating. And I, it's, it's almost like we lose a sensitivity. We almost get numb to what he did for us. And so uh, that's why he gave us, right? This, this bread and this cup. And so let's put the bread before the Lord and pray over it. And Lord, we hold this bread and we remember, Lord Jesus, what you suffered. Lord, the, just reading through it this last week, Lord, just the, the accusations and the, um, the, the false claims um, and the, the trial and the beating, the scourging that would kill most men. And yet you endured that and you endured it so much you were able to pack that cross to Calvary Hill to let those spikes be driven into your hands and feet and the spear in your side and the thorn of crowns up on your head, Lord, that just the beating that you took for us. Your body was broken and uh, Lord, you deemed us worthy. And so uh, to do that for us. And so Lord, now we, we deem you worthy uh, to receive our worship and in remembrance, we worship you and we take this cup or excuse me, this bread that is symbolic of your body that was broken for us. And so let's take the bread together now. And likewise, he took the cup and said, remember, this is my blood that was shed for you. And uh, the saying is that Jesus bled in seven places, right? His hand, each hand and each foot, his back, his head and his side. And so it's a, it's a powerful element, amen, that uh, washes us. It says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, that he, you have washed us from our sins with your own blood. And so, Lord, oh, uh, if that doesn't produce a thankfulness in our heart, uh, we're fools. And so, Lord, help us not be foolish in that area, but that we would deem your blood uh, powerful, just as we read. Uh, there's no power like it. And truly the life is in it. The li our eternal life is in the blood of Christ Jesus. And so, Lord, we thank you as we remember your blood that was shed for us. Lord, we thank you for it. And we partake of it. And, uh, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake. Well, there is a whole lot of stuff going on in the world. Can anybody say Amen. Holy cow, Amir Sarfati's already said that he's heard, they've heard big explosions on the border of Ukraine. So uh, no telling what that means. Maybe one of their uh, rockets blew up before they launched it. No, no telling what happened, but uh, that looks like it's going to go down. And, and folks, listen, that could start the ball rolling, right? It really could. And so... Uh, these are exciting times in which we live. Last week we looked at, at um, Revelation chapter 9 and we ended off when, when the four demons were released there in the Euphrates River. I'm going to knock this thing over. And, um, and they were like the big dog demons, right? These dudes were bodacious. And it says because of what... Uh, what this 200 million man army did, um, a third of the earth was killed. And it's like, that is kind of the, the, the climax, if you will, of the sixth trumpet. And, and then we get to chapter 10, and that's where we will be today. And, and I like, the Lord is so gracious. I mean, is, is the book of Revelation heavy? I mean, really, seriously. Chapter 9 is heavy. 
But the Lord then kind of gives you a little reprieve here in chapter 10. It's not quite as intense. It's not quite as gory. Not quite as much death. And I thank him for that. I think it's his grace and mercy. You know, he put this book together. And, and so uh, I think he knows when we get weighted down and, and, and need some encouragement. I'm encouraged by this chapter, right? Uh, so let's read the first seven verses and better pray and ask the Lord to help us here as we look at it. And Lord, I thank you so much for this word that is, is truly uh, alive. And, and Lord, that uh, you told us the words that you speak to us as our spirit and life. And so I just pray for that uh, to be the case this morning as we look at Revelation chapter 10. Lord, that you would take the words of, of this chapter and Lord, just take them right to our heart, that we would be encouraged that you are the truly the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Lord, that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. And I, I just pray for maybe some who are in the in the congregation today that haven't done that, haven't bowed that knee to you, I pray that they would do so. And um, Lord, because every one of us, uh, believers or not, that are in, in this world will bow before you and give an account for their lives. Uh, the Bible tells us some unto everlasting life and some unto everlasting contempt. And so Lord, uh, I just pray that you would use these words in a powerful way, even now in Jesus name. Amen. Verse one, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven and clothed with a rainbow and clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand and he set his right foot upon the See, and his left foot upon the land and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. Uh -huh. and then... <laughs> The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, and there that there should be no delay, delay no longer, but in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. And so, first of all, it starts with an angel. So the question is, who is this angel? Now, a lot of people think this angel is Jesus. I don't know if I'm totally convinced of that, though I don't have a problem with that. This could totally be Jesus. Uh, but it does say that it's an angel. We, we, we never see Jesus compared to an angel in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, quite a bit. Uh, Pre-incarnations of Christ would be called the angel of the Lord. Many believe that the angel of the Lord is a pre-incarnate Christ. And uh, uh, because he's so powerful. But as you look at the description of this angel, um, it, I, I, maybe I'm becoming more convinced. I don't know. Uh, number one, he was from heaven, Right. We know demons don't come from heaven, right? Uh, they're, they're, they're stuck here with us, tormenting us, or they're, they're in a place of incar incarceration like we looked at last week. So he came from heaven. Secondly, he was clothed with a cloud. And um, that almost always throughout Scripture speaks of the, of the presence of God, the cloud, right? Jesus, when he, when he ascended, he went up in the cloud. When he comes back, he's coming in the cloud. He spoke to Moses in a, cl you know, from cl in a cloud and, and appeared to Moses in a cloud. And so um, that would speak of the presence of number three. <clears throat> holy cow, we see the rainbow in its right place. <laughs> Finally. The rainbow of his head <clears throat> speaks of covenant. You know, God's pretty serious about his covenants. 
right? That covenant that he made with, with Noah, um, there he, as he hung his bow, so to speak, as a symbol of peace, vowing to never destroy the earth again with, with the flood. And, and also, we see it in Revelation chapter 4, it's around the throne of God. The rainbow is pretty special to the Lord. Ought we not to take it back? How to do that peacefully, I don't know if we could, so maybe we better let the Lord figure that one out. And then, uh, number four, his face shines as the sun, speaking of glory. But this is also in the picture of Christ there in Revelation chapter one, right? His, his face shown as the sun. And um, number five, his feet, it says, are like, a, like pillars of fire. This also speaks of judgment. We see the feet of bronze there, burning, burning bronze there in Revelation chapter one, speaking about Christ, the description there as well. And so uh, then, then he has a, did he have a little book in his hand? He's got a little book in his hand and it's open. It's not sealed like the scroll was because some think this might be the scroll, but it's a different word and it's not sealed. But of course they had opened the seals as well. And so um, our names are written in a book. I hope your name's written in a book. It's called the book of life. And uh, we'll, we'll get to that later in the book of Revelation. But uh, some think that it contains, that little book actually contains the rest of the prophecy of the book of Revelation, which is pretty intense from here on out, right? And um, then number seven, um, it says, uh, has uh, verse verse seven, excuse me. Verse two also has the angel taking the place of a conqueror for he puts one foot on the sea and one foot on the land. Speaking of total dominance. So the more I went through this, I'm going to, okay, this could totally be Jesus, right? Because he is the all powerful one. He is uh, of heaven and earth. And the sea and everything that's in them. He has, he has this power as he, as he stands there as, as a conqueror. And um, it kind of goes along with Psalm 2, right? Where he tells him, he says, I give you the nations as your inheritance. What the father is saying to the son there in Psalm 2. And then his voice and it thunders. The thundering voice of God. What would it be like to hear it? Uh, because Job heard it. In, in the same way, in Job chapter 26, or chapter 26, verse 14. Indeed, these are the mere edges of his ways, and how small a whisper we hear of him, but the thunder of his power, who can understand? Right? Isn't that just kind of your life? You just kind of, as you go through life, you, you kind of know, you know, you kind of know there's something that makes the grass grow, don't you? You know, there's something that makes the grass grow. And, and, and the, in, the, in the Western world, I, I, I got to have the privilege of praying with a 70 year old man this week to receive Christ. And, um, nice. and uh, he knows there's something because every day when he saddles his horse and he rides out into the wilderness, it speaks, right? Isn't that what Psalm 19 tells us, right? The, uh, and the firmament shows his handiwork, that the, the, the creation speaks of the Lord. And so it thunders to us and so many people ignore it. Job saw it again in, in Job 37, five, it says, God thunders marvelously with his voice. He does great things, which we cannot comprehend. Oh, that is so true, right? That is so true. But then in Psalm 29, one of my favorite Psalms, Verses three through nine, it talks about the voice of the Lord. And really, when we go outside, everything we see is a result of that, right? And the Lord spoke and the Lord spoke and it was so, right? It's powerful. Psalm 90, or excuse me, 29, three through nine. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory of God, 
the God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them also skip like a calf, Lebanon and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everyone says, glory, right? Glory, glory, the voice of the Lord. Oh, how we need to hear the voice of the Lord. Amen? And in our everyday lives, and that's why he's given us his word that we might hear him and he stirs us and he moves us by his word. And so this angel, don't know, could be Jesus, but I know this, he's bodacious. Some think it might be Michael. Maybe it's one of the two. I could be safe saying that probably. Uh, then he says to him, he says, uh, now the things that this, this, this voice had thundered, he says, don't, don't say anything. Seal it up. This drives commentators crazy, right? They want to know. I, wa I want to know, right? Isn't it kind of like, um, um, you know, it's a secret. I can't tell you. You hear that? People, people wish me, hey, what? What? You come into conversation. You want to know? Come on, tell me. Itching ears, right? No, we want to know. Come on, tell us. We want to know. It's, it's kind of like that cliffhanger movie, you know? <sighs> Stops. To be continued. I'm like, no. And, um, but Deuteronomy chapter 29, it says, The secret things belong to the Lord, our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may do all the words of the law. Right? God reveals to us what he wants, what he wants to seal up. You know what? It's kind of like, I've seen clips of it. I don't think I ever saw the movie, but that one movie, You Can't Handle the Truth, right? It's like, this is just too much for you right now. You don't need it right now. And so he seals it up and we go on to verse five and it says then, he, it says, and I saw standing on the sea and on the land the angel his hand was raised up to heaven and he swore by him who lives forever he make this is a solemn vow it's an oath god is into oaths right let your yes be yes and your no be no solomon told us this and i i, I share this with young married couples when they're getting married solomon said it is better to not vow at all than to vow and not pay It is better to not vow at all than to vow and not pay. And, uh, and so it's a heavy thing. This is a solemn oath. He swear. In other words, he's saying, you can take this to the bank. This is the real deal. It's a solemn oath. Jesus even honored oaths there in Matthew chapter 26. You remember where he's uh, standing there before the high priest and he says, I put you under a... Remember, Jesus didn't say a word. He was quiet as a lamb. Silent like a lamb. Before it shears, right? Until the high priest looks at him and he says, I put you under oath by the almighty God. Tell me whether you are the Christ, the son of God. Jesus was under oath. He had to answer. He said, it is as you say. It is as you say, right? It is as you, he had to answer him. He honored that. What oaths have you, you taken any oaths? You made any covenants? Have you vowed and not paid? I remember making God all kinds of promises when I first got saved. I realized that is not a very smart thing to do. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, right? Don't vacillate. Oh yeah, I promise. I really get uncomfortable when people say, I promise. Oh, man, that is a, that is a recipe for breaking, right? I promise, I promise. 
But he raises his hand and he swears by the God, the almighty God, the one who lives forever, it says here. And then he gives a description of him. It's, it's, it's this description that um, it, it's powerful, but I think, again, if you read the Bible a lot, it almost becomes cliche sometimes when it says, him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it. In all three of these things, there are things that we have never seen, that we don't totally understand about the heavens and the earth and the, and the sea. They're still finding sea creatures that they've never seen before. It's fascinating. And here's this God that he, he did it all. He created it all. It, it, it's awesome. It should have us in awe. Every single day of our life, just being in awe of, oh my gosh, here's this, this, this person. And, and we can know him and he's interested in me and you. That's powerful. I mean, we can name drop. Well, I don't care who you know, I know Yahweh. <laughs> do, some, do some name dropping, that's, that's always fun. <laughs> And so he swore this is a this is a thing and it's going to happen. And it says that there should be delay no longer, no longer a delay. And boy, there's been a delay. It just seems, seems to keep going on and on. Oh, Lord, when's it going to be over? When are you going to come? Right, we get anxious and we get excited and, and uh, we wake up tired sometimes and thinking, oh no, one more of these. <laughs> and it says, there will be day no, delay no longer, but in the days of the sounding of the seventh trumpet. So the seventh trumpet is coming, right? It doesn't happen until the next chapter in, in verse 15. It says, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. Think about the mysteries that God has declared to his, his, his servants, the prophets. They're, they're, they're fascinating. The prophet Moses, when he writes about Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the seed of the woman and the seed right, of the serpent and this, this battle that, that goes on between them, right? And, 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 and the whole promise to Abraham that his, his seeds would be as the sand of the sea, his, his offspring, and he didn't even have any kids. And, and, and then you look at Isaiah and his, his prophecies of the millennial reign, the thousand year reign of Christ, where the lion and the wolf, or excuse me, calf. It's calf. I, sorry, I threw you under the bus. I did that on purpose. I had a guy, that's because I had a guy try to throw me under the bus one time. And praise the Lord, I had just read it. I had just read in Isaiah there where um, it says, and the lion and the calf will lie down together and the wolf and the lamb. And so this guy comes back and he's kind of uh, bantering with me a little about the Bible and God and all these things. And he, he starts to leave and he turns around and comes, oh, I got one question for you. He says, when the Bible says the lion shall, shall lay down with the what? And I said, calf. I mean, it just totally stole his thunder, right? He says, you're the first one I've heard say that. Well, that's a, it's, it's the calf. Well, it doesn't matter. He could lay down with a with the lamb too, but because he eats straw. I mean, there's straw and bear eating. The straw market's going to go up in the millennium. <laughs> Lewis, you're going to be built. You're going to be busy hauling straw, right? To the lions and the, and the bears. But uh, a child will die being a hundred years old. And they'll be able to play over the, the hole of a snake's den and not be hurt. Uh, the, the longevity will come back during the millennial reign. People are going to live again, just like they did antediluvian people lived, you know, seven, eight, nine hundred years. It's going to happen again. It's mysterious. There's so many mysteries in the Bible. But the most powerful, obviously, is the prophecies 
the Old Testament prophets speaking of this coming one who would save mankind. And that he would die and that he would rise again and that he would ascend and he would be born of a virgin. All these things, these mysteries. Now, a mystery... I had a David Guza quote on the mystery. Uh, a mystery is something that no one knows. A mystery is something no one could know unless it was revealed to them. And it was revealed to them. I think, whether consciously or subconsciously, when David writes Psalm chapter 22, speaking of the cross, did he know? Did he know that was going to be a cross? I don't know if he did or not. Because there was no crucifixions in his time. The Romans mastered that. And so, but the, there's so many mysteries in the Bible. The Bible says, right, in several scriptures, uh, what are mysteries? Right, that, that um, the gospel is a mystery. Right, the, the, uh, the fact that God lives inside the church, it's, it's mysterious. That God can come and live inside of us, it's a mystery. We don't, but we're going to, the mystery is going to go away when we see him face to face. The Bible says that we will actually be like him. So are we going to understand all this stuff? Is our brains going to get bigger? I mean, my head doesn't need to get any bigger. My brain sure does, right? But he says, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. That's going to be so incredible. No more mysteries. I mean, the stars and the, the heavens, God's judgment is a mystery, right? It's just, how does he do that? Everybody. Nobody gets away with anything. That's mysterious to me. Verse 8, it says, Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take, eat, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became sour. So it's kind of like this book, this revelation. And if it is from here on out, yes, there are bitter and sweet things in the rest of the book. As he eats it, right, it's sweet, and then it becomes, it becomes bitter. And so um, <clears throat> Warren Wiersbe says this, and he's taking it as God's word. And, and God does not force. Notice John is not forced to eat this book. He says, go take it and eat it. it. It's an act of his will, right? That he goes and he gets it, he takes it, and he eat it, eats it. Rowan Wiersbe says this about it. He says, God will not thrust his word into our mouths and force us to receive it. He hands it to us and we must take it. Have you been eating God's word? Because sometimes it is bitter and also it is sweet, right? Everything from Genesis to Revelation in the word of God is bitter and sweet. The Christian life is bitter and sweet, is it not? Mm. Right? When, when God, God talks to, to Moses about, today I sent, present before you, life and death. Death is bitter, life is sweet. And so, all these things in life, uh, life and death is sweet, judgment, right? Remember? The, the saints crying out, when are you going to avenge us, O Lord? When the vengeance comes, it's going to be sweet to the saints. It's going to be pretty bitter for those who are on the other end, right? Um, heaven and hell. It's bitter. It's sweet. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Or could I say bitter? But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Right? It's the power of God. 
the resurrection, when you talk about the resurrection, I just read a little thing that Don Stewart did on the resurrection. He mentions four resurrections or four periods of the resurrection, right? Starting with Jesus and ending with the great white throne. So, the Bible says there in Daniel, I think I, I mentioned it earlier, Daniel chapter 12, it says this. At that time, and we're getting close to this with, this with this angel here. It says, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince, who stands watch over the sons of the people. That's why some people think this is Michael. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. The third mankind dying, I'm sure. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, every one who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So here he, Daniel mentions the two resurrections. One's sweet and one's bitter. And that gospel to us, right, has... It smells good, it looks good, it tastes good, it feels good. But to those who reject it, the Bible says it is the stench of death <clears throat> to those who reject the gospel. So if you rejected the gospel, can I just encourage you? Receive it. Receive that good news. Kind of like my friend did the other day. He, he told me that. I receive it and I believe it. I just thought... <coughs> That is so cool. That somebody can just cry out to Jesus and believe in him and really put their faith in him and be saved and be on their way to heaven. And their life can be sweet. It not, does not mean that there will not be bitter times because all of us, we don't get out of this life unscathed, right? Yep. As I go through God's word and I would love to be one of those preachers that just just make everybody feel good. But I realize, and I mean, it scares me to death. I'm going to have to stand before God and give an account for my life. For my life as a pastor, right? And I know that's laughable. But I'm going to have to stand before God and give an account for what I share from his word. And the thing about it is you've got to share both, right? If you're going to be a minister of God's word, you have to share the bitter and the sweet both. Hopefully balanced. I know I get a little out of balance occasionally. But um, it's scary because James tells me that a teacher actually bears a greater judgment. So if I don't tell people the truth, right? Some have said that, that the truth without love is brutality. Uh, but love without truth is, is just, it's just sloppy agape. It doesn't mean anything. It has so, no substance to it. It's those, those, those two things, intention. Just like grace and God's grace and God's, God's justice. They're intention, right? And, and, and they're perfect because he's perfect. I'm going to close today. Is it hot in here or is it me? Um. It's a cold it's February for crying out loud. We had a good excuse when it was July. But I, I want to I close with these words. It was an old song. I remember my grandma singing it years ago. And it, it, it says, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise. Just to know, thus saith the Lord. Folks, listen. If the Lord said it, that seals it, it is done, and it is truth. So may you guard your heart with his word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day and for the worship that we can bring to you. As we look at your word that is truly so full of truth and power and life, Lord, I pray that we would all take it to heart. Even today, Lord, as we, we just lift up our nation and we lift up the nation of Canada and Ukraine 
and, and Israel and Russia and China and all the people that are in those nations that have an opportunity to taste and see how sweet it is to love Jesus. And so, Lord, I just, I just pray that you would uh, move on our hearts, everyone in this room, Lord. You, you have a, a, a purpose for all of us to reach this world, this lost and dying world, with the truth of who you are. And so, Lord, help us to not be intimidated by the bitter things in this life and when things don't go our way, but help us to be motivated by the sweetness of who you are. Yes. And, Lord, how it all ends, it ends in a glorious way. And so for, for that, Lord, we thank you and praise you. And I just pray for anyone here today, too, as we have a time of prayer afterwards. Just want to encourage you to come and cry out to Jesus, Lord, and he hears your cries. We cast our cares upon you, O Lord, because you care for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. We'll do one more. Maybe. Men, okay. if you would remember to stack the chairs, please, before you exit. Thank you. your burden of sin there's power in the blood power in the blood would you or evil a victory win there's wonderful power in the blood there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the lamb there is power wider than snow there's power in the blood power in the blood sin stains are lost in its life giving flow there's wonderful power in the blood there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the land there is power service for Jesus your King. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is Amen. Right, if you guys need prayer, anyone come up. Have a great uh, afternoon. I'm going to go home and take a nap. See you this evening. <laughs>